Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here today in the homeland of the Lactamish people, known to others, the Lummi Nation people, a place where my great-grandmother was born and raised and grew up and used to call Madrona Point home and in many other locations in the San Juans. Many stories of the Pacific Northwest, and I'm going to take you on a journey for a little while. But before I do that, by a show of hands, being from the Pacific Northwest, how many of you have ever heard of a creature named Bigfoot or Sasquatch? <laughs> By a show of hands, how many of you believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch? About seven months ago, my son plays for the city of Ferndale's AAU team. And he had about six buddies over, mixed race. And uh, it was about 11 p.m. We had just watched boxing together. And they were outside of all things, he was out there cutting kindling with his buddies in the backyard. And we live on five acres at the mouth of the Nooksack River where it enters into the Bellingham Bay. And we, we live out in the woods. And he was cutting kindling and he heard something and the dogs were barking in their kennel. And he looked at the dogs and then he looked to the right and then he did a a double take. And his buddies kind of sensed what he was looking at, so they looked. And one of the buddies jumped up and slammed that sliding door open so fast and went flying in. My son jumped up, he's 14, started running in. And before, right when he got to the sliding door, those guys who were behind him threw him out of the way. He was inside already, threw him. He went like this. They all came in and he slammed the door and he was walking backwards and this big giant Sasquatch or Bigfoot creature hit the sliding glass window and was pounding on it and my son's face was, you know, just, I've never seen a face like this before of terror and fear and that's when I took the mask off. <laughs> I was worried. He was scared. He watches Bigfoot, uh, you know, all those shows, and he's a Bigfoot nut. He, he believes he's out there. I share that with you, and that went, off, that went viral. So that was on Facebook in a matter of five minutes, and I had hit, my son had hits on that, like you wouldn't believe, comments. But I share that with you because I am under the federal enrollment, federal government. I'm listed as 100% Native American. And in public schools, back when I was going to school, and I'm sure now, um, there's this perception painted of Native Americans that were this stone-faced, you know, I don't know what you expect to see up here when you see a Native American. If you're not, if you don't encounter them often, um, you just don't know what the perception is. And uh, I am 100% Native American. And, uh, I just wanted to share that with you because we are not the stone-faced people that are taught. We are humorous. We are athletes. We are doctors. I'm, I'm very proud my first cousin is a family physician. His sister is a professional soccer player. My son played golf at the driving range in Southern California quite often with a guy named Ricky Fowler who is a professional golfer and is Native American as well. Um, so I wanted to share that with you just to loosen up the room a little bit, but I was asked to speak here and I'm honored to be asked. I was honored to be asked to speak and I love the topic. This is America. And I was asked what my title would be. And my title is Sacred America because for me, I have, along with many other thousands of Native Americans, we have a genetic memory 
that is a little bit different than what we experience today. And I'm gonna take you on a short walk, a short journey. I'm gonna share a story with you. And I'm gonna take you into the past. What did the past look like? What did Orcas Island look like 3,000 years ago? I've met sixth generation islanders, and I think that's the furthest back that I've, I've met so far, but that's pretty far back. And like Adam mentioned earlier, here on Orcas Island, through archeology span study, it's 3,000 years that I go back. And when you put that into perspective, what is that, 1,000 BC? And up at Cherry Point, where Donna just had a, shared a discussion with you, 1500 BC documentation there. Actually, recently was 7,000 years it goes back there. So being 100% Native American, growing up on a little Indian reservation of about 12,000 acres, and growing up with individuals like my great-grandmother who lived here and was born in 1892, it's not easy to break free of these stories, of these realities that took place. <clears throat> I'm 39 years old. She died when I was five. I got to spend some time with her. I got to walk beaches with her. I got to hold hands with her. I got to hear stories from her. One of the, the, the individuals who opened up with a prayer song this morning got to live with her for, I think, around 20 years. And I call him Aksala in our language as teacher. I want to hear those stories because he lived it with her. So 3,000, 4,000 years ago, the trees, this is about all you can do when you hugged them. Today, when you walk around Orcas Island, you know, this is a big tree. And there are bigger. Stewart Island's got some big trees. The firs, the cedars, the cedars which created the vehicle for my people to travel these waters, which were our highways, which were our roads, which were these, these canoes acted as our horses. 3,000 years ago, we were one with the earth. We were one with nature. We drank from the rivers. We drank from the streams. We didn't worry about getting sick. We ate the fish. We ate the clams, never, ever worrying about getting, to, getting sick from eating the shellfish. Back then, you would have seen villages right here. You would have seen a big village at Madrona Point. Unity, family. Everybody with a purpose, whether you were the gatherer of, of the weeds that built our nets, whether you were the gatherer of the medicinal plants to take care of the people when they got sick, or the builder of bows and arrows and arrowheads, tools, we all had a purpose. Humble, humble people. Our economy was fish. At this time, you can come up to a river, it is said, and walk across that river on the backs of the salmon because they were so plentiful. Oysters, clams, killer whales, Killer whales could communicate with one another with no interference from the busyness that we witness out there today. Miles and miles and miles. Maybe 3,000 years ago, if you dive into the, the bay there at Madrona Point, you can hear the mothers talking to their children, the killer whales. The air is so crisp, and it is today, here at Orcas Island. Big difference here from California. And, and that's one thing we need to cherish. But 3,000 years ago, what was it like? What was the air like? What was the intake? 
3,000 years ago, this was a magical place. Rich, rich, rich with the blessings of the Creator, the gifts from Mother Earth. Today, we still see it as rich. But what was it before? In 1855, so I'm going to jump a couple thousand years ahead. In 1855, the world that we once knew for thousands and thousands and thousands of years changed with the snap of a finger. We did not go to war with the United States. We entered into a treaty. Understanding that settlers and homesteaders were coming in, we negotiated with the United States, entered into this treaty, which under Article 6 of the United States Constitution states a treaty with the United States is the supreme law of the land. In this treaty guaranteeing our people forever to harvest in our usual and accustomed areas, fish, to hunt, to gather, to go to the mountains, to get these medicinal, medicinal plants that were so important to our people. We entered into that treaty down at Point Muckle, or down at Muckleteo, Point Elliott Bay, and we had one year to evacuate Madrona Point, San Juan Island, our 32 reef net locations on San Juan Island. So January 21st, 1956, if you can imagine for a moment, when we think shackles in prison, prisoners getting out of a bus, we see this. And that's what our canoes look like. Shackled together, taken to this new home called the Lummi Reservation. Once populated here by our ancestors. And not long ago, and I share that story with you of my great-grandmother born in 1892 because it really puts it into perspective that 1855 wasn't that long ago. If I had the opportunity, I'm 39 years old, to walk this earth with her, it's not that long ago. After the treaty was signed, we moved to this reservation. Many lived on the river, drank from the river, still at this time. And not too long after, you saw change. You saw the railroad come in. And... Uh, you saw industry come in, you saw canneries come in, but at the time, in that time frame, is when those of you who are sixth generation would have witnessed the trees. And for me, being on the reservation, looking at Mount Baker and looking at the mountains over there, this, you know, you, you, it looks scalped at some points, and you see just a big, giant, empty section. And the logs were shipped down, and the river was diverted from where it originally went to where it goes now into Bellingham Bay because it was easy access to the city of Bellingham where, where they would bring the timber. And then after the timber was cut, then this rich resource of fish, the plentiful fish, began to be harvested and canneries were opened. And I remember a story from my grandma about Bellingham Bay Horrific times when you can see fish floating all over Bellingham Bay, just their bellies cut out because the bellies roll up nice and easy and they're put in the cans. And that hurt me because what fish means to me, it's, it's part of our culture. It's, part of, it's more than just harvesting. It's, it's, a, it's a way of life. It's our shalangan. So we had challenges and moving forward to 1974, many of you may know of the United States versus Washington, more often referred to as the Bolt decision, but really it was the United States of Washington versus Washington State. And the reason that took place really quick is the federal agencies came out to hear what these Native Americans had been griping about for so many years, looking back at 1905, uh, Alaska Packers, 
in, in reading the testimonies of the Lummi Indians held at gunpoint for harvesting in their usual and accustomed areas and in their reef net locations at Cheltenham in different areas, came up and sat in a particular spot to witness what the Native Americans were saying was taking place with Washington State. And it just so happened these federal agents got gassed because the state's staff didn't realize that they were there with the Indians, which triggered the bold decision, United States versus Washington. With that settlement, United States won, and it gave the tribes 50% and the state 50%. And Native Americans back then, some were angered because we had this guarantee, not a hope that our kids would fish one day and the waters would be clean enough for us to, for us to harvest forever, not a hope, a guarantee. So some were angry, but some were happy that we can now fish again in peace. And at about that time, you would see refineries going in and different activity taking place with industry. And you would see resources start to plummet. And today when you walk some of these beaches, you see do not eat, the, do not consume the shellfish. Hazardous. Litter along the beaches. Populations of species plummeted to nearly nothing in the last 40 years. Today, we must understand what a fish consumption rate is. What is the fish consumption rate in Washington State, and why is there such a thing? Does it really control the pollution that is dumped into our waters by industry? And if that's the case, how much fish can I really eat a day based on the pollution that is allowed to be put in our waters? This was a joint gathering last, last year with the Lummi Nation and many Washington State fishermen. We've united, we get along great, and we united and we said, no way, no more, this is enough. Our ability to harvest and our ability to safely feed ourselves is bad enough. We say no more. We don't want 52 million tons of coal sitting on the edge of the Salish Sea. And as an elected leader of my nation, our treaty rights are not for sale. And that's an example. Because there is no way that myself as an elected official has any right to strip that child right there of his rights and his grandchildren's rights. There's no way. And that's a principle that we live by. Just north of where I live, my reservation, this is Tawasan. This is some of the realities out there today, and being that we're in, some call a toilet bowl, being in the Salish Sea, Orcas being in the middle, Juan de Fuca Strait is your entrance, and you go up through Canada, but it's just a big, all the way down to Seattle. They call it a toilet bowl. And if catastrophe takes place inside of the Salish Sea, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for myself? But what does it mean for you? What does it mean for all of us Washingtonians? It's not if, it's when. And the question is, what are we willing to allow these corporations, government, to sacrifice so that these corporations can come in to this territory for this? Justified through jobs, yes. Justified through tax dollars, yes. But what are we willing to sacrifice? Who is going to speak for your unborn grandchildren?
I commit to it. Here's another reality. Today, technology plays a big part in our lives. My grandfather used to wake me up every weekend at daylight. I'd have to go down and pluck the fish off the net and clean the net with him in front of his house. And we'd go to the parts store together and get material to work on the boats. And always doing something together. Always sharing stories with me. Always hugging me, loving me. Engaging in conversation together. My grandmother, same thing. Walking the beaches with me, teaching me things teach me about the water and the importance of protecting. Today, there's a convenience called an iPhone, called 650 channels on the television, called an iPad, called a computer, called the internet, that acts as our children's babysitters today, a lot of times. Not all of us, not all the time. I'm just as guilty too. But it's a reality. If we look at where we're at today, what does the future look like in terms of communication, in terms of even worrying about things like this, if we're not sharing stories with one another, sharing stories with our children, encouraging them to stand up, encouraging them to learn? What does the inevitable future look like if you take the time frames of where we are today, you take the last 40 years and you look at what has taken place. And it's subtle because we live here. But what did it, what did it look like 50, 60 years ago? What did the waters look like? The pristine waters of the Salish Sea, the pristine rivers, the streams, the plentiful fish. This year, there was a 99.9% .9 diversion rate of the largest sockeye run that any of us would have ever seen. But it failed to come to Rwanda Fuca. It went around Canada for some reason. Never been seen before. But if you look at the time frames and you break it down, how long did it take to get here? And I'm not a mathematician, but what does it look like 20, 30, 40 years from now? And more important, what are we going to do about it? What are we as individuals going to do about it, like Hendrick Smith said? What are we willing to do? How are we going to step up for our sacred America? Because it's your America just as much as it's my America. These waters, these animals, these Creatures that don't have a voice to speak. These unborn children who should deserve to live here just as you have lived here and enjoyed the beauty. Are we going to be that voice? And that's what I ask of all of us here today. And I encourage us, and I know this is hard, I encourage us to take a good hard look at what this is helping us become, and ask us if we really like it when our kid is trying to engage in conversation and we're texting or we're checking emails and really be aware of that. And, and, and where is that going to take us in the future? What is this helping us become? It has truly been an honor to be here today with you all. In my language, I say, Heishka, thank you. <laughs>